This is Desert Places by Robert Frost. Snow falling and night falling fast, oh fast, in a field I looked into going past. The ground almost covered smooth in snow, but a few weeds and stubble showing last. In the first stanza, the speaker is walking past a field on a snowy evening. Hey, I thought this poem was supposed to be some kind of a desert thing. Yes, this will make sense later. In the first line, two words are repeated, falling and fast. They both start with the F sound. That's a poetry thing. Yes, alliteration. But it's not just for the fun of it. The F sound kind of reinforces the idea of falling fast, doesn't it? And then there's that word O, which adds emotion to that first line. What kind of emotion does it add? Excitement or panic. At this point, both are possible, but it will become clear. Let's move on into the next stanza. The woods around it have it, it is theirs. All animals are smothered in their lairs. I am too absent-spirited to count, then loneliness includes me unawares. There are woods around the field, and then it says that the field is theirs. Kind of like being excluded. It's really bad when the trees are excluding you. And then the line, all animals are smothered in their lairs. Now this is a great example of how word choice, or diction, can create a tone. Consider how this line would communicate a whole different feeling if it said, all animals are cozy in their dens. Aww. Smothered is nothing like cozy. Oh, that's how you kill old people in crime dramas. By putting a pillow over their face while they're sleeping. It means to be deprived of air. And lairs are nothing like dens. Cute little bear cubs can live in dens. What lives in lairs? Vampires, dragons, monsters. Exactly, malevolent things. So smothered in their lairs is a pretty harsh way of saying that small animals are hibernating in that field. So this line is communicating the unique perspective of the speaker. He says, I am too absent-spirited to count, too absent-spirited to matter. Spirited can mean all kinds of things, energetic, enthusiastic, determined, passionate, just to name a few. And I think the speaker means pretty much all of them. Also note that he describes himself by the absence of something. And then the loneliness includes me unawares. Is the speaker unaware or is it the loneliness who creeps up on people but doesn't know what's doing it that's unaware? This use of the word loneliness is the first of four derivations of that idea. Let's move on to the third stanza. And lonely as it is, that loneliness will be more lonely ere it will be less. A blanker whiteness of benighted snow with no expression, nothing to express. So he's really emphasizing the loneliness in this stanza, and he's saying it's only going to get worse. This stanza also reinforces the theme of absence that was begun in the last stanza, when he described himself as absent-spirited. In this stanza, he projects this emptiness onto the environment around him. The snow blanketing the ground is blank and expressionless. It is said that one of the functions of poetry is to express the inexpressible. Frost here is attempting to express the absence of the expressible. The last stanza. They cannot scare me with their empty spaces, between stars on stars where no human race is. I have it in me so much nearer home to scare myself with my own desert places. More than a few years back, one of those National Geographic magazines came with this map of the universe. And as I studied this map, for a moment I caught a glimpse of the immensity of the thing and it kind of scared me. The speaker isn't scared of the vastness of the universe because the immensity of the emptiness inside him is so close. He calls these spaces within him desert places, vast and barren and empty. And now the title makes sense. That is Robert Frost's Desert Places. Thank you and we'll see you next time.